different alloys and try out new superconductors, more or less the pragmatic approach. I'm a fundamental physicist and I try to understand at the deepest possible level the phenomenon at heart. And therefore my approach is, when those materials are so complicated, is there a very, very simple system which shows the same phenomenon and then I can really study it. So I'm asking, what is the simplest system where we can study superfluidity or superconductivity? The answer is, it's a very simple system, and maybe surprising to you, just take a dilute gas. Well, you would think, well, dilute gases, we know everything about them, that's like the ideal gas uh, about which we learn in chemistry classes, and you may be even more surprised when I'm telling you, I mean a very dilute. I mean a gas which has the density a million times thinner than air. Some people would actually regard that as reasonable vacuum. But, so this is the kind of density of gas. And you would say at low density it should really follow the equations of gases. However, our research has shown that if we take those gases to very, very low temperature, they can profoundly change their behavior. They no longer behave like a gas. They behave like a liquid, like a solid, like a magnet, like a superconductor. Now, uh, the secret here is, of course, a very low temperature. If you have something which is a million times more dilute than air, a billion times more dilute than normal solids, that means the forces between the atoms are a billion times weaker. Billion, it's a big number. But if I take the system to a billion times lower temperature, then the ratio between forces and temperature is the same, and then those systems, those gases, behave like solids, like other forms of matter. So therefore, we can study the simplest form, the simplest occurrence of superfluidity by working in very dilute systems at very, very low temperature. So let me now talk about, with this introduction, about gases at very low temperature. What happens to atoms at very low temperature? Well, everybody knows that the atoms slow down. Well, how much do they slow down? Ordinary, at ordinary temperatures, I should have actually maybe asked you that as a question, how fast are the molecules in air? Actually, I'm also a teacher, and when I give a public lecture, it's not just about entertainment. I want you to learn something. <laughs> and if there's only one thing you should never forget, is the following. Your skin is bombarded by zillions of air molecules. And you should know, after this lecture, if those molecules are at a snail's pace, at a bicycle's pace, at a you know, sports car pace, and the answer is, it's the pace of a jet air. And to make sure that you never forget it, I want to explain it to you. Uh, the reason why I can talk to you is because my voice travels to your ear at the speed of sound. But the speed of sound is almost exactly the speed at which the molecules in air move around. If the molecules in air would stand still, my, my speech would not propagate. So the speed of sound is the molecular velocity in air. But you also know that jet airplanes just go a little bit slower than the speed of sound because breaking through the sound barrier would have uh, environmental consequences. So therefore it's not a coincidence. The speed of a jet airplane and the molecular motion of the, uh, of the air molecules are all necessarily connected to the speed of sound. So if you don't understand anything else in my lecture, I think I've already reached my purpose. <laughs> anyway, but we take them down to very low temperature, and that means the motion from a jet airplane becomes as slow as my finger now. It really comes down to a crawl, centimeter or millimeter per second. But this wouldn't be special, because this would just be a gas in slow motion. To study that would be cool, but it would not be a new scientific discovery. But what happened is, at very low velocity, there is suddenly a phase transition, a dramatic behavior uh, in the property of the dramatic change in the behavior of the system. Similarly, when you cool down water and suddenly it becomes ice. When 
jump into a swimming pool a little bit above and will be below the freezing point and you will find the dramatic difference. <laughs> and something similar is going on in this gas. Suddenly, all this major part of the particles is starting to march in lockstep. This is something very special. And this new form of matter, where particles march in lockstep, uh, reflects the wave nature. Marching in lockstep, marching synchronously means it's just one matter wave one quantum mechanical wave which oscillates and this form of matter is the Bose-Einstein condensate. Actually, I like this cover of Science Magazine because it really depicts a lot of physics. I think to the physicists or even to the people who take the physics class, I can point out, look at those faces. They are absolutely identical. Every atom is identical to another atom. And it is really this indistinguishability of atom why they, be, why they can behave as one wave because you can't, you can't distinguish between them. Uh, so therefore, uh, if I really want to show what is going on, I have to draw this picture. They are sort of all smeared out as a wave. It's not that they are only I that they are identical. They have lost their identity. You cannot point to them anymore. But of course, this would not look as attractive on the cover of a magazine. <laughs> Let me give you another analogy for this phase transition, for this profound change in the character of the gas when we reach low temperature. And this is actually the way how I explain to my children, well, my children are grown up now, but when they were little and they asked me what you're doing, I try to explain to them uh, what happens at low temperature by using the analogy of laser light. And when I told him, said to my son, Holger, well, you know the difference between light on a light bulb light which comes out of a laser. But I wanted him to say laser light is coherent, all the photons march in lockstep, but he simply said laser light, yes, laser light is cool, and he got it. There is a difference. <laughs> Even in this language, I didn't have to explain it more that laser light is a very different quality from ordinary. And actually, the difference is very similar between an ordinary gas and the Bose-Einstein psychology. Here we have one electromagnetic waves. Here we have many, many waves going in all directions. Here we have atoms which move sort of randomly and collide with each other. And here we have atoms which behave synchronously as just one wave. So the research I'm talking to you about can be described in one sentence. It is the creation of matter with the properties of laser light. It meant the Bose-Einstein condensate is for atoms what the laser is for light. And this is pretty profound. I will not have time to talk in great detail about superfluidity later on, but one thing should be obvious. If people, let's just use, you know, atoms are little kind of men or little figures, if people randomly walk around on a busy street, they bump into each other, they elbow each other, there is a lot of friction. But when everybody walks in lockstep, it's much more efficient. There is no friction. There are no collisions between people. So marching in lockstep, behaving as one big wave, is really at the heart of superfluid and superconducting behavior. So this phenomenon that Bose Einstein condensation, this new form of matter, would exist, has a very long tradition. It was predicted in 1925, but the fact that it was only realized 70 years later meant that some new methods, some experimental methods had to be developed. And what was missing was methods to cool down gases very, very close to absolute zero. So let me therefore explain to you how can we reach very, very low temperatures in the laboratory. And if I talk about uh, my own record as a scientist, in some of the most creative or productive years of my scientific life, of my scientific life, I was building refrigerators. But as you see, not refrigerators of the ordinary kind. The first step which takes us down to pretty low temperatures is called laser cooling. Today I gave a guest lecture in the quantum physics class uh, of the department chair of course, uh, and gave some background behind laser cooling. Unfortunately for you today, I can only give you the two-minute version. And the two-minute version is the following. If we illuminate atoms with laser light, they absorb the light. But atoms, 
When they have absorbed a photon, they cannot keep it. They have to re-emit it. This is called fluorescence. So it's the same what well, we have ordinary lights here, but if you have uh, fluorescence light, you see atomic fluorescence. The atoms are excited by an electric discharge, and then they emit light. So atoms cannot keep the photon, they have to re-emit the light. So that would mean as much energy goes into the atoms as goes out, unless we play a trick, unless we find a way that the frequency of the emitted photon is higher, the emitted photons are more energetic than the incoming photons. And then every time an atom absorbs a photon and emits it, it radiates away an extra amount of energy, and this energy is taken away from the atomic motion, and that means the gas has less and less energy, it slows down, it becomes colder. You would ask, well, how can you change the color of the light? There are very simple ways to do it. The simplest one is the Doppler effect, which is uh, simply the effect that if a moving object emits, uh, emits a wave, uh, you perceive the pitch of the wave differently, whether the object is moving towards you or away from you. The classic example is if you have a train which, which sounds a whistle, you will hear a higher pitch of the sound when the train is approaching you than when it is moving away from you. And this effect alone is enough to provide cooling. Here you see laser cooling in action. This is a vacuum chamber in one of my laboratories. We have sodium vapor inside, and when we shine laser beams onto the sodium vapor, you see this fuzzy ball. These are, you can see them with the naked eye, these are atoms cooled to a temperature thousand times colder than interstellar space. Laser cooling has revolutionized atomic physics, and, the, and three of the pioneers to develop laser cooling were rewarded with a Nobel Prize in 1997. Well, laser cooling is a great method, but it is not sufficient because of its limitations to take us to both Einstein condensation. So what was needed was a second step of cooling to reach extremely low temperatures, not just thousand times colder than interstellar space, but a million or even several billion times colder than interstellar space. Laser cooling is more subtle. Evaporative cooling is much easier to explain because that's something you can experience in everyday's life. When you have a cup of coffee in the morning and you wait, the cup of coffee cools down. And one reason why it cools down is because of evaporation. You see a little bit of steam rising above your cup. And that happens because the most energetic water molecules pretty much jump out of the water, leave the cup, because they have enough energy to do so, for the physicists to overcome the work function of the water. But if the most energetic water molecules have escaped as steam, what remains behind is less energetic on average, that means cold. And if you have to go to classes or you have an appointment and you want to drink your coffee fast, you sometimes force evaporation by blowing it and then evaporation goes faster. Okay, now you know everything you have to know how we can go down to nano temperatures. We need a cup, we need a container for the atoms. Well, there is no container, no material container which can be cooled to those low temperatures. Also atoms which just stick to the walls of the container. So therefore we use an invisible container made of magnetic fields. The atoms, because of an unpaired electron, are magnetic and they are just bouncing back and forth between magnetic walls created by magnets. So we have a magnetic container, a container with magnetic walls. Well, uh, and now we blow at the atoms. Uh, we blow at the atoms with microwaves. It's not exactly what happens when you blow at your cup of coffee, but the idea is that by blowing at the system with microwaves or radio waves, we force the evaporation and we go to blow at how low a temperature can we reach? Well, we usually do not publish in the Guinness Book of Records, but they picked up uh, one example of our research where we were able to cool for the first time a gas below one nanokelvin, 
less than one millionth of a degree away from absolute zero. I should actually say when we published this research in the Guinness Book of Records, we picked it up, it was nice for the students because they could tell their parents, hey, look at the Guinness Book of Records, this is what I have done. <laughs> because often parents cannot read the scientific publications, but that was something they could relate to. So since I talk about low and high temperature, let me again wear the head of a teacher and ask you what, is, what are the highest and lowest temperatures which are possible. Well, the lowest temperature, I think this is well known, the lowest temperature is absolute zero. Uh, and zero energy, uh, sorry, zero Kelvin, zero absolute temperature means there is zero energy left in the system. All, all energy, all excitation energy, all motion has been extracted and everything now is at a standstill. And I think this immediately explains why you cannot get go lower, because if you have no energy left, at zero Kelvin, well, there can't be less energy than low energy. This is not so obvious if you use the centigrade or the Fahrenheit scale. At Fahrenheit, absolute zero is minus 460 degrees, and then people may ask the question, but why can't you go to minus 461? Well, because at minus 460, there is no energy left, and it's impossible to go lower. So that explains why we have an absolute zero, an absolute lowest temperature, because it, con it, it, it relates to the lowest energy possible for that system. What is the highest temperature you can reach? Infinite. There is no, you can just put more and more and more energy into the gas. Particles start moving at the speed of light, but you can still put more energy by, by nudging them closer and closer to the speed of light. So the highest energy is infinite, and let me avoid the small thing here. Okay, so I've told you now why we want to create gases at very low temperature to obtain insight into superfluid behavior. I told you how we do it, using lasers and using evaporation. But now comes the moment where I have to show you how it all works and how do we observe that we have really created the coolest matter in the universe. So that takes place in a laboratory. You see a vacuum chamber here, but it's completely covered in optics and electronics and cables because, well, in principle it's easy to shine a few lasers on your atoms, but in practice we have to control the lasers very carefully, otherwise they would not do what I just told you they should do. But the most important thing are really students. This research is only possible because of the excitement and the energy of the students who work with me. It's fa fairly scenic. Uh, we work with visible lasers. I still get a thrill out of it after 20 years if I walk to a laboratory and I see the different colors, yellow laser light, red laser light, green laser light, and everything perfectly bounces back and forth between mirrors and four objects. So, back to the Bose-Einstein condensate. So now, just assume you have a vacuum chamber and in the middle of this, this vacuum chamber has that size. There are magnet coils of this size, and in the middle of it is a tiny little bit of gas. The dimension is a tenth of a millimeter. It's about the thickness of the human hair. That's easy to observe by just using lenses. But just imagine, you have a vacuum chamber, and you think in the middle of it is the coolest stuff ever done. How would you show it to the world? How would you prove it to yourself? that you have reached an extremely low temperature. No? Don't say stick in a the thermometer. I don't <laughs> think there's any thermometer which, which works at the nanometer scale, unless we really go back to basics. Remember, temperature is just a measure of energy, and in the gas, the energy is the energy of motion. So if we observe directly the motion of the atoms, we know immediately what their temperature is. And we can make a Gedanken experiment, a thought experiment as follows. Imagine a big vacuum chamber, and now you put in a little container which contains the gas. If you pop a hole into the container, the gas will just stream out. And with some form of stroboscopic illumination, I will tell you more about it, you can see how fast do the atoms move. And that's, I think, the most complicated equation I have. 
Uh, if you know the velocity, you know the kinetic energy, and you know the temperature, absolutely, without any calibration, without any doubt. Now, in our experiment, it's very simple. Remember, we do not have a material container. Our container